Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Steve. So you say, hey, Steve. Hey. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Or actually, let me ask you a great question. So what is your typical, like everyone's got a relaxation thing or everyone's got something that they enjoy? Like I like watching sunsets and sunrises. Yeah, I, I definitely enjoy um sunsets and sunrises but um what really recharges my batteries is going out and storm chasing okay you said storm chasing now i'm wondering what do you mean because i mean everyone goes like i drove in the rain i'm like okay but have you ever seen twister when they're like chasing after a hurricane and stuff i mean it, it doesn't have to be that exciting but i mean just the same time storm chasing is something that's very interesting because like have you ever seen like lightning when it's warm out like there's no rain it's just like a dry lightning or whatever it's called but you feel that electric in the air that that's fascinating to me yeah definitely um i mean storm chasing for me is just uh you know there's different types of uh, thunderstorms and supercells is what we have out here on the plains a lot of times in the spring and being underneath the supercell is just a completely different experience than being underneath a normal thunderstorm. You know, it's just, you got the incredible lightning, um, you have the structure of the storm, and then of course you have the tornadoes. What exactly is a supercell? So a supercell is a rotating thunderstorm, um, normally created by, uh, so you have uh, the sun hits the ground and creates an unstable atmosphere. And then it starts, um, creating updrafts, which is like all of that unstable air starts lifting, um, rising. And as it rises, it rotates. And as that rotation increases, and then you get um, different layers and speeds of shear throughout the atmosphere, um, it rotates and tilts. And so you get a supercell out of that rotating, tilting thunderstorm. Now, when you're looking up at the sky, you probably see something different than I do. Like if I look up at the sky and I see like reds, yellows, and like what looks like Trix yogurt. I always said that when I was a kid is like the sky looks like Trix yogurt. And my parents are like, is he mentally challenged? I have no clue because <laughs> they just didn't know what I was seeing was the mix of colors. They're so beautiful and they swirl together in such a way where it was like Trix yogurt. So you probably look at it like a little bit differently. You probably look at it and be like, well, that's this and that's this and that's because the air is doing this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you just, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, like if you, if you never experienced it before, but um, you can see on a, on a supercell, the, the full updraft and how the storm, the air is rising and rotating. And then that you can see that tilt from the wind shear throughout the different layers of the atmosphere. And then there's different parts of a supercell. You have the, the inflow jet, which is where um, those warm, moist air comes into the storm. And then you have the, the rear flanking downdraft where you have cooler, drier air coming out the backside of the storm. And it's just honestly a really complicated process. It's almost like an engine. There's all of these moving parts. And obviously, the more fine-tuned the engine is, the more structured and the more violent the supercell is. But, you know, it's just like anything else. The engine is not quite as fine-tuned. It's a little messier. What got you so interested? Did you have like a experience like when you were a kid that just got you addicted to wanting to, I mean, when we say storm chasing there, are we talking about like going out and seeing them? Are you talking about like driving towards like a disaster or something like that? So driving out towards um, a super self thunderstorm, and it doesn't necessarily mean driving out towards a disaster. I mean, I, I'm not personally, you'll get a, a mix of uh, storm chasers, like what they want to experience through storm chasing. And for me, it's just experiencing just like the awe of nature. And you can go out and you can try and chase these violent tornadoes. Like personally, I don't like seeing destruction. So I prefer to see a tornado out in an open field somewhere. You know, I, I don't really have a choice as to where that's going to happen, but um, I definitely don't like to see things destroyed. So, but um, to answer your question about kind of like what spurred my um, interest in weather, um, I grew up in southwestern Florida, uh, haven't always lived in Oklahoma. Um, Hurricane Andrew was my first um, kind of like site on, you know, violent weather. And um, I got to see that it wasn't where I lived, but it wasn't very far from where I lived. Um, so I got to see that in the destruction afterwards. And then um, in 2004, my hometown was hit by a category four hurricane, Hurricane Charlie, um, and almost completely wiped off the map. So uh, that was definitely a unique experience for me. And um, I think kind of drove home that uh, desire to kind of go out and just 
experience weather more. Yeah, it's crazy how much we take for granted when we look at like there's, oh, it's it's sunny out, it's not raining, or if it's raining, it's not sunny out. It's like you understand, like you can really make it whatever you want it to be. Like I really have to stop myself sometimes when I'm like, you know, getting like maybe I'm late for work and I'm rushing to get everything done because I live by the beach, man. I live in Ocean City, Maryland. It's a small town that's surrounded by water. But when you walk out the front door, you can really forget to just take a nice and smell that salt air just fill your lungs i mean the worst storm we've ever had here was uh i think probably around hurricane sandy you know we our town it was one of those like apocalypse scenarios where it was like that we shut down um we only have two bridges that enter into ocean city so once those are shut down you're kind of stuck where you're at and they just put up sandbags over the bridges and they evacuated the town and only a couple people stayed like business owners. Um, one happened to be my dad. My dad works in a radio broadcasting thing and he wanted to stay on air for all the business people that needed something because they were just locked inside, had nothing to listen to. They wanted to know what was going on in their town. Not a lot of people were covering it. And, you know, I remember afterwards he was like, we're going out to this restaurant. I'm like, that's a fucking like expensive ass restaurant like how we've we've been eating burger king and shit like why are we going there and he's like i got a coupon the business owner thanked me for you know staying here when you know he had to park his car on like the second story because the flooding was so bad since we're surrounded by the water it floods a lot even if it rains really hard well this was the ocean had risen up and next thing you know it was coming over the streets there were some people that were surfing in the fucking street which is probably what i would have done if i would have stayed but it's interesting to see how like much you take for granted on a daily basis when it comes to just being able to drive on a road just being able to have your home without like an earthquake coming by or a storm coming by and really you got to kind of take hold of the moments when you're able to see these types of storms i'm fascinated with nature um even though most of the world's like, well, why do you care about being outside? It's like, cause there's a, there's a relief to it. Even if it's a clear day, even if you're watching a sunrise or a sunset, I used to work jet skis. So I would take the morning ride out. I would see these like bright oranges because that's the sun rising up in the morning. And then I would be out for 12 hours or something. Next thing you know, I'm on the last ride. And as I'm heading back into, you know, where the dock is, I would see, reds and all these dark colors of the sun finally setting and it was so beautiful just to be able to experience something like that we're like i mean that's a heaven scenario for me that's a place of relaxation for me you know calm and just watching you know just everything seems like there's balance in the air yeah and that's that's definitely how it is for me when i'm out like in the open field like out in the plains and you're just standing in front of a supercell and it's just it's really hard to explain but it's just I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. Like the, you, the, you have the wind rushing against your face on the inflow jet of the storm. And sometimes you're getting hit with sand and, you know, lighting striking off in the distance and people are like, ah, oh, you're crazy. And I'm like, no, it's like, it's like, it's where I find my peace. So. It does get scary though. If you have like a lightning or something hit right beside you it happened to me when I was playing mortal Kombat at a campground, like the old school arcade one, I was in this like underground part of the uh, camp store. They had like a little underground arcade and I just heard this loud bang. And I was like, what? The? And I like fell off of the seat and everything. I was freaking out, but it hit right beside the camp store, actually split a tree in half. And I was like, I've never been close to something and I've never experienced something that loud before where it was just so primal where I was like, it really puts in a perspective of the shit you take for granted when, you know, when people go, why is my dog afraid of thunderstorms? Because he knows that it's got some power behind it. Like there was a, a story about a guy that had been hit like 22 times by lightning. And I'm like, at that point, does God just hate you? Whatever it is up there that's just striking you with lightning. But he goes, I only counted 22. I'm like, wait, how many in total did this person get hit? He goes, I was hit technically 26 times. But the 26 times was like right beside me. It wasn't me directly. The 22 was me directly. I'm like, yo, that's like, you got to count those two. Like that's, that's still a feat, you know, being able to experience something like that and being able to survive from it. I mean, even just witnessing, if you get to see the little, we all sit to see the little pictures. I mean, half of everybody's background to their computer is a wallpaper of thunderstorms or some shit like that. That's the default. It's cause it's fascinating. And if you get a clear picture of it, it's like, whoa, like that's why people take videos or take all these shots that are constant, 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 like shutter shock photos, because they're trying to capture that moment when you see that spark, when you see that lightning that just crackles through the sky and ends up going somewhere. 
Yeah. And it's just, it's just one of those things that it's just really cool to experience. I mean, and there are some risks that come with it because, you know, you're out in an open field and you're, you're kind of subject to a little bit of danger there. So I had uh, last April, um, I was chasing and I was outside of my vehicle and about three telephone poles up from where I was at, I had a lightning bolt hit a transformer and I didn't even see the strike until it returned back to the cloud. So it's a, uh, there's a little bit of risk involved there. So you just got to be careful what you're doing. And, you know, you kind of, I think most people that chase, they accept that there's some risk involved. Do you ever get um, nervous, at least when like you're in the midst of it? Like what's, what's that feeling like? Do you get an adrenaline surge when you start hearing it go off around you? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely adrenaline going on. I, I think that's one of the, it's probably, I've never been skydiving, but I'm thinking it would probably be similar. Like you get a rush. Um, but there's also a little bit of, in the back of your mind, there's a little bit of nervousness sometimes. It just depends on the situation that you're in. What's a place you'd like to go to be able to check, like maybe a storm out, like, or be able to see some of the scenery? Um, definitely, like, I'd like to chase more in the northern states, um, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. There's just some, like, beautiful landscape up there. Um, Oklahoma is a very pretty state, uh, but it's just nice to be able to venture out sometimes and explore things outside of your comfort zone, I guess. I went to Hawaii for two weeks and everyone's like, it's so sunny all the time. I'm like, the, it rains a lot. I was there. It was probably 70 degrees out. Like you wear a short sleeve shirt, but it was like misty rain. It wasn't hard rain. It was misty rain. But I mean, every hour, then there'd be like a break of an hour where it was like a clear sun would come through and you would see rainbows constantly. And I'm like the, the music on the radio in tune with everything going around in the environment. It fits so fucking perfectly where I was like, this is exactly where a place where like you would actually want to live or want to experience. I mean, I went to go see Diamond Head. Um, and it was like, I guess the same day happened to be when they were having a little bit of a storm thing on and off rain spurts. And as you climb up to the top of this mountain and you look off, you get to see all the black, dark clouds where it's like, that's a storm coming. You know, I worked jet skis for a very long time. So like when I'm driving into my town, for instance, I can look at the water and be like, it's going to be a storm day today. And they're like, there's a chance of it, but it's like 20%. I'm like, look at the ocean. Like everyone says calm before the storm. Sometimes when it's like super windy and the waves, you get to see white tips everywhere. Like the, the tops of the waves, we call them white tips. When you see them like that, you know, a storm's coming and it always ends up happening. It's like when people say I can feel it in my bones. I'm like, there's something you can tell by the water, by anything. There's just a feel in the air where it's like, this is going to be something that maybe we're not expecting. It's like the movie Twister, except not so insane. Like it is interesting to watch that movie and see all the, they're chasing after a hurricane. It's doing all this damage, but you don't want that to actually happen. Cause you also think about like, those are people's homes. Those are businesses. Those are whatever that's being affected by it as well too. Yeah. And, and definitely, I mean, like when you're here, it's, it's hard to explain, but as you get here and live here and experience things and get used to kind of how the climate is like, you start to feel those days too. Like the, like you, you'll step outside and like, you'll get that, you know, strong Southeast inflow wind. And, um, it, it just like, it feels like a tornado day. I want see they had, they used to have those sirens that would warn you if like a storm was coming. I used to think that was like war of the worlds with that. Uh, I was like, Oh God, like aliens are coming. But then you find out it's just a storm or something. I mean, some areas and some places, like I have friends in other States that are talking about like, yeah, we just had a hurricane. We just had this. For me, I, we're so close to the water that every hurricane that ever comes down or we get a warning about, it goes right out to sea because it's that's that's what it's trying to go for. It needs water to even keep functioning. You know, it needs moisture. And it's interesting because when we get really bad winds, people are like, it's raining out. I'm like, that's not rain. They're like, what do you mean it's not rain? I'm like, step outside. And they're like, it's sand. I'm like, yeah, it's the sand getting picked <laughs> up and hitting you. It's like getting hit with a sandstorm. It's like tearing into cars and stuff. It's like, if you ever buy a car, you don't want to get one that's been on like the East Coast because it's salt water. That salt water ruins the undercarriage of it, all of it that you don't even get to notice. Like that's like the big thing down here. They're like, all right, you got to knock the price down a little bit since we're on the East Coast. It's like, all right, I get it. Salt water, I got you. Yeah, it, I mean, you'll be out on a, on a supercell, and um, the inflow jet will get so strong it will actually start lifting dirt and sand off the ground. And I've had several of them where I've gotten done at the end of the storm and you know, going to get back in my car and I'm just completely covered in sand. It's just, it's wild. 
Do you like the apocalyptic feeling it has like when you're under the dark clouds and it just feels like, oh shit, like something's about to go down. Like a, a match between Undertaker and Macho Man Randy Savage. Like you know there's something's about to happen. There's about to be this big thing. That's like it with a storm. When those dark clouds are around, I'm like, yo, like there's no one on. Like I remember when the pandemic like first began. They're like, I think it was the first week there was one really bad storm we had where I was like, it, there's no one on the street because everyone's inside their house. I'm heading into work and there's just this like, I mean, newspapers, like it was like a movie just rolling across the street. I was like, it feels like we're in apocalypse. Like it's about to rain really freaking hard, but it's like, it just felt so like movie like scenario. Yeah. I mean, like uh, probably two months ago, I was chasing a, a tornado Warren supercell in Carnegie, Oklahoma. It was at night. Um, you gotta be a little more cautious when you're chasing at night, but, um, driving through town and pretty much the entire town is at the shelter and I'm driving past through like an empty ghost town with sirens blaring. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's a wild, wild thing to experience. Are you thinking, yeah, like, <laughs> I will say, are you thinking like, holy shit, no traffic. Thank you. Or are you yeah. thinking like, maybe, I, maybe I'm a little doing something. A little, I think a lot of times like people, they, they prepare for the best. I think on news too, they kind of blow it a little bit out of proportion when it comes to just, you want to make sure you're extra safe, not extra sorry. But man, I, I remember my uncle, we're trying to get him to go during hurricane Sandy. like, you got to go, you got to go. He's like, I've been here 50 something years. Nothing ever fucking happens. I was like, dude, all right, all right, man. You know, and he was right. I mean, there was a little bit of flooding. Luckily, our street was a little bit of rate um, raised up a little bit more than the others. So we didn't happen to experience any first floor flooding, like a lot of places, but Man, it's 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 hard because it is a little bit risky when you talk about like when there's something dangerous coming, you don't know what could happen, especially with weather. It's so unpredictable. That's why like I'm like anybody could be a weatherman. It's so hard to be able to guess what's going to happen. One thing you know, well, the storm's going to go right over us and then it ends up going another direction. That's why it's so hard to nail down. Well, I think I think I've spent, you know, a lot of time chasing and a lot of time getting to experience things and knowing where to position myself to be in like a safe spot. So, I mean like not necessarily the average person has that access to all of that like experience and time spent out chasing so when you get a tornado warning it's like yeah you probably need to be if you don't know what is coming towards you you probably need to be in a safe spot so you need to um like listen to local authorities like it's it's a little bit different with chasers because like i said we we go out and we do this day after day and we know where to be and how to be safe and so it's just a little bit different I have a bit of a theory now. Imagine how many people talk about like, we had this wonderful date and then the rain and then we played in the rain. And I'm like, maybe he planned it. Like maybe he knew that it was going to rain on that specific day at that time. And then that's how the, then he got false memories, bro. Oh, it's going to tear me down a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, how do you predict them though? Like, how do you, do you just randomly fall across them or do you just look, check your weather maps, check everything, see what's going on? So there's actually a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, you have the storm prediction center, which gives like a general forecast for what the environment's going to be like. But then you also have all of these websites that have um, computer models. And um, then there's um, uh, uh, graphs called skew tees and hodographs to kind of simulate what the environment's going to be like then. And then you just got like general like observations. So you can go out and you can look at like a, we call them CU fields, but it's like cumulus fields where you have um, clouds starting to bubble up um, on those chase days and you kind of just like get a visual of like what looks good and what doesn't because you can tell I mean like the really intense strong updrafts um, they'll be rising quickly and uh, they'll have like a really um, like firm cauliflower flower structure to them and the the storms just look good like and you can tell the ones that are struggling they just visually don't look as good so uh, there's there's a lot that goes into it um, there's a lot of like Hey, I think I'm in a good spot. And then now I'm going to reposition to this storm. So, and you have good days where, where things go great. And like, you see like these beautiful tornadoes or this beautiful supercell. And then you have days where it's like, ah, I kind of struck out on that day. So what, um, is that one disaster that I would say you would want to go see? Like if it, I, all damage aside, but like, what's one thing you would like to witness or be in the presence of? So it's going to sound a little weird um, uh, coming from like going to supercells, but um, I've always wanted to experience an earthquake. So and it's one earth of those things that an earthquake. Yeah. Why an earthquake? I don't know. I just think it's one of those things that I, I haven't experienced yet. And uh, it's, it just, um, 
it's one of those things that I know is like a powerful type deal. So, yeah, I talked to a volcanologist and she put a perspective in my head. I would have never even thought about, see, like we think technology is so advanced, but we can never stop a, a volcano or we can never stop an eruption or anything of that sort. We don't have the technology for it. Best thing you do is warn the people. And I was like, what's your biggest fear? She's like, one day I'm gonna have to tell all these people on this Island that the volcano is going to erupt. And you know how many people have lived here for 50, 60 years and are not going to believe me and say nothing ever happens. She says that that's, that's the biggest fear that I have. But I'm like, yeah, man, it puts in your perspective. She started start explaining like earthquakes, like the walls bend, like they're made of like, like rubber or something. And I'm like, oh my, I don't know if I want to be in that. I'm more than <laughs> happy. I don't know. Cause then you got tsunamis, man. Cause tsunamis sound even worse. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of crazy weather across the planet, but as far as like, it's never happened before. Like it had been, uh, when hurricane Charlie hit us, it had been 40 years since we experienced a major hurricane. And it just like almost wiped my town off all, completely off the map. I mean, like 85% of the buildings in town were either damaged or completely destroyed. So we had wind gusts in town um, approaching 190 miles an hour. Dude, I this makes me wish I was a weatherman because I feel like I could do a better job where I would just be like, imagine I'd just be on the news and go, there's a giant wind turbine monster that eats people coming to your town. That would get anybody to grab their shit and go <laughs> like they're just like, well, we got a, this coming this way at approximately 50 miles an hour with a high gust winds of 85. I'm like, you got to shake it up a little bit. You got to be like, there's a giant creature from the sky that shoots Fireous lightning out of its eyes, and it's going to kill you and your whole family. Maybe you can't put that on the news. That sounds like it would scare a lot of people. Well, and it's kind of funny because I think they do adapt over time to like changing the wording and um, just different things like that. Because uh, May 3rd, 1999, the tornado that went into uh, Bridge Creek and Moore uh, near Oklahoma City, um, they the meteorologist was like, didn't know how to like convey the urgency because he knew it well, a large, deadly tornado was barreling towards a populated city. So he put the words tornado emergency in the warning. And that was the first time that that was ever used. So, and I mean, you'll see different things like that. Like now we have a particularly dangerous situation. So I think the, that, that kind of uh, terminology will probably continue to evolve. Do you think that the weather service does a good job or do you think that they do a pretty bad job at trying to alert people when it comes to a natural disaster like this? I think they do a phenomenal job. I mean, uh, you look at, um, I personally know people that work for the National Weather Service, but you look at the time that they spend um, looking at these warnings and looking at these storms. And a lot of times you have limitations. So if you start at like X location and you're looking at a storm, what you see in it is based on how far the radar is from it and whether there's any obstructions in the way. Um, so, I mean, you don't always get the full picture of what's going on in the storm, but they, I think by and large, they do uh, a good job of warning um, when they're supposed to trying to get the message across, getting people, you know, ahead of time, like, hey, there's going to be storms tonight. Um, this is the risk with these storms. Um, they, they just do a good job of what they do. Have you ever heard of the Farmer's Almanac? Yes, I have. That thing that was created so far, so far back, but it was so damn accurate. I don't know how they pulled that off to where they could predict like weather like weeks out. And somehow just be, I don't know if it's like a Nostradamus where it's like, it's a coincidence that it happened, but it's like, they got so much freaking accurate. I was like, it's weird to see how we've kind of shifted to being able to track it every like five minutes. It'll change. Like you could check the, the radar and you get to see something pop up out of nowhere that you wouldn't have seen before. You know, we're predicting weather patterns based on what, you know, the flow of it, what, which way it's going, you know, that's a little bit more sciencey than I know. But it's still like, there are some like old school methods that still work better than the stuff that we're using today. Well, people talk about uh, models and how the models were so wrong. And it's like, if you drop, like take two rubber balls in your hands and you drop them, okay? At first, the bounce is going to be similar. But as you, they bounce more and more, they're going to diverge. Their paths are going to diverge. And that's kind of how the atmosphere is. Things are constantly moving. So one model may predict like, hey, it's going to take this path and it's correct. And the other one may say it's going to take this, this path and it's completely different. So it's just... Uh, it's just a very complicated process of things constantly moving. Now, was your worst experience the one that you have with, next to the transformer? So 
define worst? As in, like, I don't, I was scared. It was a horrible experience, but, it, you know, it, it could be fun too. I mean, I guess that's a good question. You asked me, that's a good question. Damn. Who's asking the questions here? Hang on. I, I got to gotta think this question through because yeah. I got, think it like could turn it into two parts. One that was really bad storm, but it could also be fun. And then one that was like, I don't ever want to experience that ever again. Like I've gotten a flat tire and had to walk eight miles. I hope that never fucking happens again. <laughs> so the, I don't ever want to experience that again would definitely be a uh, hurricane Charlie. And it was just a hurricanes are different. Uh, you got hurricane Katrina that produces a lot of uh, surge. And then you have Charlie that was almost no surge, but a very violent windstorm. And I, it's just hard to describe the building we were in was almost completely destroyed. Um, we had, we were in a like large four story kind of commercially built hospital and um, it blew all the top floor windows out. Um, all the ICU windows were blown out with patients inside the building. Uh, you could hear like large pieces of the roof ripping off and slamming into the parking lot. It just, I mean, it kind of was, was like being in a war zone. Um, a window would blow and the suction from the, the pressure change would pull the doors on the room we were in. So it was just one of those things that was kind of intense uh, for me personally. Um, yeah, something that I don't quite want to experience again. Nothing that that intense anyways. I, um, I think most of my weather like extreme scenarios have probably happened when I was a jet ski guide because they'll take a ride out if it's hard rain if it's thundering out as long as it's not lightning that's the only restriction is once you see lightning you have to give everybody back and remember we had a northeastern come through we get these a lot like this is very common for my town and we were out on the water i mean the sky was like black like it was only 4 p.m it shouldn't have been like looking like night but you know it's very very dark clouds above us and the water i mean as soon as you would have to go like two miles an hour and as soon as you know, start going, the jet ski would hit a wave and water would just splash you. So you're constantly getting hit. It's like, as soon as you start drying off, someone throws a bucket of water at you. You're like, fuck, I can't get dry. And then I, you know, we're in this riding area. I'm sitting on this jet ski. I mean, literally like rocking, like just like side to side. Like I, you're, you can get seasick if you're really focused on it, but the water's only about waist deep. So I'm hoping nobody falls off, which during a storm, people are going to fall off in this choppy of water. This big dude fell off. Now he needs help getting back onto his jet ski. First thing I have to do is I have to hop in the water, flip over his jet ski, make sure it doesn't sink, make sure all the water is filtered out of it, then start to get this guy back on here. Dude, this dude grabbed me by my life jacket. I mean, 400 something pounds. And I'm only like a buck 35. And he just grabs me and I slam my chest against the seat. I'm trying to like, he's trying to drown me basically like pulling myself up um help him finally get back on it and then i flip off the back because i'm like i'd rather just fall in rather than his whole jet ski because trying to get someone back onto a jet ski when it's in the water it's rocking side to side there's no balance it's going to end up flipping again i'm like i'll jump off you stay on and you get your balance and then we'll go from there but another person had flipped over their jet ski starts rolling it's underwater now it's like starting to go down i'm like oh shit so i'm grabbing that jet ski this wind and these waves are knocking this jet ski. I mean, I got handlebars hit me right in the jaw, just constantly fiberglass bumping into your knees. And it was just the worst experience where I was like, as soon as I got that jet ski afloat, I was like, we're going back. Like we still got 30 minutes left. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, this is the worst thing in the world. It's going to be even worse on the way back. You know, you're trying to take all these people that are riding a jet ski for the first time. They want to go fast. It's so dangerous, but man, it really, it puts gravity into a situation when you realize what we take for granted for on a daily basis. Like I love watching a storm. I live right on the water. So I like watching the, you know, thunder, all that right hit her right above the ocean, just out my backyard with a coffee or something. But when you're out and experiencing it, man, it's something you really got to take in because those are some of the moments that I really enjoy. Like even how shitty that experience was, I think about it. Like it's ingrained into my mind when I think about all the times I got to see the beautiful reds and oranges of the sun. And then all of, also all the times I saw the purples and the blacks of like how dark it was getting when a storm was coming. It's something you really got to enjoy. And as far as the one that you experienced, but you kind of like, it gives you a passion to like keep doing it or maybe not exactly in the manner that you did but i had a, a friend of mine that um uh is a chaser that uh kind of encouraged me to go night chasing and i was really not keen on the idea i didn't really like the idea of night chasing it's kind of hard to see like you don't know what you're doing um so we went out and chased one night in texas and 
uh, the, the stores were insane. We got like cored by one of them, you know, and when I say cored, I mean like, uh, you get in the hail core and you're just getting pounded by hail. Um, but after that experience, uh, it got me to the point to where like, I got a little bit more comfortable with going out at night and like getting just a little bit closer each time to the storms. And, um, now I'm pretty comfortable chasing at night. So was it a big thing in your mind that like, why, why would night be different? Like I, I look at it kind of like the same, is it just because you can't see like if it's right above you or not, it just randomly comes out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there are some dangers like with storm chasing that um, like you are able to see visually. Um, so you're usually like watching the storm, but you're also scanning the sky above you because there's some weird little things that can go on. You can have a tornado on the ground, but also like a tornado developed like outside of where that tornado is at. So like satellite tornadoes. And so there's just some things that like it's easier or better if you can see what's going on. Um, at night, you don't have as much of those opportunities because unless you're getting constant lightning, you don't have that. The sky's not lighting up like it usually does. Now, with what is your thoughts about wind, like super heavy wind? Does that fear you as much too? like scare you a little bit? So wind, I think I like have a natural like reservation towards just a little bit because of um, the experience with Hurricane Charlie. Um, I have gotten more accustomed to being in some wind events. Um, <laughs> I was in a pretty crazy one a couple of years ago in Fairfax, Oklahoma. Um, the wind was blowing uh, 90 miles an hour. Uh, I was doing some minor damage in the town. Um, so that was that was kind of intense for me. Um, that kind of brought back those uh, those memories of the hurricane and uh, just a little bit. So we have uh, really like small skinny trees in my neighborhood. And I mean, every time we have a giant wind come on, I'm just like, I'm waiting for one of these just to hit right into my bedroom, freaking kill me when I'm sleeping or something. I know that's a horrible thought to have, but dude, you, you, when you go like wake up in the morning after a night of like a heavy storm, you're driving through the town and you're just seeing tree branches everywhere, blocking roads. And you're like, well, how much do we take? Like we not even notice all this on a daily basis that could be just right floating above our cars, you know, like street signs, literally like the, where the street lights are look like they were on like rubber bands, like flinging through the air. Like someone just like you're hanging your clothes out to dry. And I mean, I, I like wind. I think the only thing I'm really scared. Hey, you want to hear my wind sound effect real quick? I got to do it. Hold on. Sure. <laughs> I guess it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm working yeah. on it. I'm working on it. Um, but <laughs> but hail, dude. I've been scared of hail since I saw the movie Godzilla when I was like six years old. When I saw that giant size of like a mini fridge hit that dude in the head, I'm like, Jesus, is that possible? And I've only come across it maybe once or twice, but you see those videos of that dude like taking a video of his pool, and there's just these giant like I don't even know how big they were like, like the size of a fridge hail hitting into his pool and just see this giant. He's like, Oh my God. And like, he's like, Oh, here's a little bit of hail. And then you just hear this bang. And then you just see these giant chunks of hail start falling. He starts going, Holy shit. And it's tearing up his porch and everything. I'm like, you're not going to survive that. Like little kids have been killed by hail. People have been killed by hail. That's intense. Like nobody even really realizes this. Like we take so much shit for granted. Yeah, hail, hail does get intense. I mean, you get the smaller hail, like quarters and pennies, dimes, and then you get up to like golf ball size hail. And that's kind of like the line to where it starts doing damage. Once you get above golf ball size hail, then it then it's really starts racking up the damage. And um, last year, I ended up getting a, a windshield shattered by baseball size hail. Um, it, it was the winds were blowing pretty good, probably like 50, 60 miles an hour, and it was just slinging the baseballs. And I took one one right to the center of the windshield it cracked the windshield. So you got to make a bucket list of like weather stuff to experience or just local things to experience. Like for instance, you said you got your windshield cracked by hail. I've never had a windshield cracked by hail, but I've had a windshield cracked by a crab. So like <laughs> that sounds nuts, but if you are, li if you live in my town, you know, this is pretty common. What happens is seagulls will dive into the water and pick up a crab or pick up a shell. And what they do is they fly really high and they drop it. And they try and break it open and they eat what whatever breaks. And that's what happens. They crack my windshield. I'm like, that's like, I, I said that to so many people. They're like, what? And I'm like, that's, that's what I'm saying. Every like state, every place you go to has one thing or something that doesn't happen anywhere else that you have to like check off. And I want to know what all this is. Like a lace made a chip flavor based on every single state. And I'm like, that's probably like that with weather shit. Like there's like, 
well, there's alligators in Florida. So it's like, okay, well, that's something a lot of the world probably doesn't get to experience. So that's something different. Well, I can tell you, I definitely had a bucket list shot um, a couple of weeks ago down in Texas. Um, there was a tornado down near Vernon, Texas, and I got to see um, once it got a little bit further away from me, uh, I was up close, but once it got further away, I got to see the tornado on the ground, a rainbow, the entire storm structure. You could see the entire updraft all the way up to the top of the storm. And then uh, the moon had just popped out uh, beside the thunderhead. So did you thought you were going to die? <laughs> it, it was pretty intense i was like this is not real right now <laughs> i would be looking from like the uh looking for the kid damien from omen the devil child that just comes out of the corner i'm like oh this is the end this is where this is where the antichrist pops up good lord man i've never been in like i've heard stories of like people like a storm and then a hurricane on top of it i've never had them all separate or them all together like that i've only had them all separate like i don't i've never been a tsunami that's probably a fear for me too um mostly I think I can hold my breath, but people say, no, there's none of that. There's like, there's, that's not even a thought. Like that's a dumb thought. And I'm like, well, man, I'm a good swimmer. I live in a beach town. I'm used to the ocean. You're just telling me the waves a thousand times bigger. Maybe. I don't know. I like to be optimistic. Um, well, I got a bomb shelter in my backyard that's filled with beef jerky. So I think I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> but earthquakes, like, I mean, I've never been in one of those before. I've definitely felt like maybe what you'd call like a small magnitude, like a very low, low, low bit. But I've never experienced like my buddy was in Japan when that tsunami hit. And then he talks about like, yeah, it's just we're in the middle of a recording. He's like, it's just an earthquake. I'm like, just an earthquake. Like, <laughs> what are you saying right now? And you realize how normal it is for a lot of people that experience these things on a daily basis. Yeah. And I think you'll get a lot of that out here. You know, you hear talk to people about um, tornadoes and it, there's not like really a huge reaction. It's like just a normal thing. But if you go. I don't know, the California and talk to people about tornadoes, they're going to be like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, my buddy Chuck didn't see um, snow until he was in his 30s. I'm like, fucking what? Like, I was a little kid playing in snow. I was the kid from like a Christmas story that was wrapped up in all the clothing and fell over and he couldn't get back up. Like, I, I love snow. And he was like, dude, I didn't see it until I was in my 30s. And people looked at me like I was insane because I was like, oh, my God, snow. Like, and just taking videos. Like, I was just like a new person in the world. I'm like, I don't ever – want it to be like where I've never experienced something like that, where it's just so astonishing to me. Like I honestly never want to experience a tsunami, but I also want to see what that's like, like watch real footage of that. I don't think a lot of people really see it outside of the movies. You know, it's horrible to see the disasters it makes, but it really puts in a perspective of what life is. You know, life is this thing that we just go into our homes, go to our work, and we don't think anything else above it. The fact that we wake up every single day, our heart works, our lungs work. The fact that we're, me and you are in a Zoom call right now. The fact that this all yeah. worked together without like internet connection issues or something like that. That is so fascinating. And it's something that people don't even think about. They just expect it to happen. And when their Wi Fi doesn't work, they start bitching on the internet or waiting, or they're putting up drafts of posts that they're going to post when the internet turns back on. Yeah. I, I just think there's like, there's this draw to like the unknown and all of these like crazy events because. I, like you see Hollywood and like there's tons of disaster movies like and there has to be a reasoning behind that it's because people are drawn to that kind of stuff it's not necessarily that you want to see like the destruction but like there's something about the the own unknown or being like underneath something that is so massive that it just makes you feel small I want to I wish I could find a place in the world where there's no like impacts of natural disasters but there is none there's no places like, yeah, you can go to a place that doesn't have a volcano. You can go to a place that doesn't have an earthquake, but it's like, can't escape all of them. There's going to be one thing. One place is going to be a disaster zone for hurricanes. I mean, what's interesting that I found about at least was Pompeii when I was researching about that back in school. There are people that were like in the middle of doing something that are just solidified in ash. Like they're just statues because the volcano came and they just got covered in ash. I think a famous one is a mother protecting her child and they're just perfectly like statues in ash. And then there's a one guy that survived the volcano at Pompeii, but he died um, not from the volcano, but a giant stone block had fallen on him. And like, you just see legs coming out of the ground and he looks like a cartoon. Like he got squished by an anvil. And I'm like, imagine that you survived this disastrous volcano. And then you get crushed by like a block. I'm like, that's terrible. But it's like, I, where's the safe spot besides being bubble boy. I don't know. I have never found me. I wouldn't say no. Hawaii's got, 
I guess Hawaii's got volcanoes, right? Yeah, Hawaii is volcanoes. Shit. What's a good spot to go where I'm actually going to like not be like, I'm in the middle of the desert. No, I want to be somewhere where there's still entertainment <laughs> or something. Yeah, I, I mean, you're not going to get away from it. Like, uh, there's just it just depends on where you go. Like, California has earthquakes. Like, the mid, the Midwest, like the center of the country has tornadoes. And it's not the only place that has tornadoes, but it has the violent ones that, you know, destroy things, uh, just like take out entire towns. And then you have uh, the coastline that has hurricanes. And I, I just, there's natural disaster pretty much everywhere. It makes you kind of look at it at a bigger view. I mean, I always considered thunder. They used to say it was like the, the god was bowling you know the sound of bowling pins you know we're able to relate things because i think it makes it easier to be able to handle or understand is when we can put like personification into it but man how do you personify a giant oh yeah i guess i did a giant creature <laughs> for, made of wind that eats people that is oh see this is i love talking about storms man because some of the best experiences when you feel it in the air you literally feel your hands stand or not your hands your uh hair stand up on your hands and your arms it's just something where it's like this is like i you can never recreate this you might be able to watch or get it from watching a movie with like m night Shyamalan. you can get that hair popping up but still it's like it's intense the fact that this your body knows more than your mind does that there's something going on that's bigger than you. Like they can, they can feel it on a level that you can't even perceive. And ironically, I think how you experience things depends on your position and reference to it. So like, for example, if I'm outside of a supercell, like just, you know, outside the edge of it, watching it and experiencing it, it might be like awe inspiring to me. But if you were in the middle of a supercell with a tornado going over your house, like it's a completely different experience. You know, when I went through Charlie, like it was kind of traumatic. Like there was a, a period of time for probably six months to where I didn't sleep right at night. Like it's just a, it depends on your reference point. And with your um Twitter, for instance, you're just trying to show people some of the fascinating things that a lot of people don't really realize is happening around them. Yeah. And I, and just, you know, experience things. And um, like I said, I've always had a fascination for weather and uh, not, that long ago uh three four years ago got into photography and so they're like a good mesh with each other did um do you use that as well too like to talk to other maybe people that are doing the same thing as you storm chasing or something to be able to kind of like talk you know maybe some things you can't understand like i there's probably plenty of stuff that i take pictures of where i'm like look how beautiful it is and a lot of people are like you don't know you're in the middle of a hurricane i'm like what what <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the storm chasing community is definitely pretty tight knit. Like everybody like has each other's backs, and um, you know, there's definitely a lot of knowledge there to be gained. So it's, it's a, a good good community. That's that's awesome. I mean, you gotta what what's what what are you guys gonna fight about? Who's been in a bigger storm? I'm like, look, man. I I'm I mean, it's like it's like every family they have their their drama points, but you know, yeah, I kind of just tend to you know, move on past that. And <laughs> technically let, we've let, all let, been in a, a, a middle of a, a, what is an asteroid coming to hit earth, but it was blocked by Jupiter. Thank God. That happened like three Octobers ago. Nobody really knows about it, but there was an asteroid on uh, whatever uh, tr travel point to earth. And then it just Jupiter sucked it up or Venus, whatever the one, or maybe it was Mars. No, it wasn't because Mars is after us. Mercury, that's the one. Maybe. I don't know. Could be false information, but that's the point of this podcast. We don't, it's conversation, not factual. You would be surprised how much space debris Jupiter shields us from. It is Jupiter. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was right. Yeah. But they, there was that giant, no one even knew about it. I found out like four months after I'm like, wait a minute, we all could have died. Like, holy shit. I think that was the time Halo, no, was it? Yeah, Fallout 4 was big. I was like, I was playing Fallout 4 and didn't even know. We all could have died. I, 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 There's so much life left to live. I still want to go experience Shakespeare. Yeah, that's... that's... He's dead. <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, you've given me enough of your time, man. Where can people find uh, your Twitter page where people can see some of the storms that you chase and at least some of the photos that you take? Um, it's at Storm Chase, uh, the number four, and life. And I'll make sure I link it all in the description, man. Is there anything else you want to, um, you want to end on? No, I just appreciate you having me on. And it was, it was fun talking. What shirt is that? It's a nice shirt. 
Um, this is actually, uh, so I got this from the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge, which just one little last tidbit. Oklahoma is a very diverse state as far as geography. Like a lot of people think of it as completely flat and it's not. There's like different areas. We have mountains and forests, you have uh, rolling hills, and then you have the Wichita Mountains, which is actually uh, behind me. Uh, probably can't see it, but um, it's just like a cool little mountain range with like a bunch of like grass valleys in between. And um, it's probably my favorite place on earth. So are you getting ready to storm chase right now? Yeah, I was actually headed to um, in between cities. So I kind of had to find a place to pull off, but I'm headed to uh, Texas right now to storm chase. You don't know how special I feel that you stopped a storm chase just to be able to talk to me. But I can also sense in your face, you're like, let's end this call now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. I, I get I get an early start. So I, I've got plenty of time to get to where I need to be. So. Well, Steve, I appreciate you for giving me your time today. And I appreciate everyone listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. All right. Take it easy, man.